Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our happy post-launch press conference for Juno and the Atlas V rocket launched earlier in the afternoon. Here to talk about the mission and the status of the Juno spacecraft is Jim Adams, the Deputy Director for the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters in Washington. Scott Bolton, the Juno Principal Investigator from the Southwest Research Institute. And Jan Chotis, the Juno Project Manager from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we'll begin first with Jim Adams. Jim? Well, thanks, George. It was a, a great day for a launch, and we're extremely happy that the weather cooperated with us and Tropical Storm Emily dissipated in the Caribbean. Um, we're at NASA headquarters. We're extremely proud of the Juno team um, entering the launch phase of this, our year of the solar system. And um, we're looking forward to just some fantastic science in roughly five years' time. Uh, I think the team should be commended for delivering this mission on cost and on schedule in an environment that is extremely difficult and the expectations of the team were very high. And so I, uh, I convey my thanks to everybody who was involved in the Juno uh, effort. And uh, we look forward to the science that we're going to get back here in 2016. Right, Scott? Take it over. Yeah, yeah 2016. In fact, uh, next stop is Jupiter. We arrived there July 4th on 2016. Go into orbit there, polar orbit, and start to unlock those uh, secrets of Jupiter that we've been uh, trying to get at for a long time. I can't be happier. I mean, I could not be happier than this. It's sort of like a dream come true. Um, you know, more than 10 years ago, we had these ideas. And then, uh, you know, yesterday, looking at that rocket, I realized, started really starting to put together that this is happening. There's the spacecrafts inside the rocket, and we're about to leave. And, um, and today, we left. <laughs> <laughs> and we're on our way. And, um, you know, at this point, the, the spacecraft's out, it's open, the solar arrays are uh, open, we're flowing our electricity through the veins of Juno, and we're on our way and um, getting ready now to gather all the great science and get everything working. And uh, it's just really a thrill. It's um, exciting, it's a relief, because <laughs> there's some tension associated with this, of course. But I'm happy that everything worked on schedule, and um, you know we're on budget on schedule, and we launched on the first day. The whole story is consistent, so I'm happy. And Jan will give you some details of uh, exactly what's going on with the spacecraft right now. Thanks, Scott. Well, this is certainly a, a wonderful day for the Juno team. Um, we had uh, planned for this day for many years. Uh, everything uh, clicked off like clockwork today. Uh, we didn't um, launch at the opening of the window, but we had planned to have our 69-minute window here today to allow for uh, things to uh, check out at the last minute, make sure everything was on track, ready to go. Uh, we lifted off at 12.25 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We separated 53 minutes later, um, so about 1.18 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The launch vehicle left us off at the um, nominal attitude, right where we wanted to be. The launch vehicle folks did a fantastic job, gave us a great ride. Um, and the Deep Space Network was amazing. Um, Perth had acquired us, uh, that's, that's the ESA station that we had for downlink recording um, at 1.18.30. 24 seconds after we separated from the Centaur upper stage, the Canberra DSS-34 station uh, locked up with us at uh, 1.18.45, 39 seconds to lock up after separation, which is just a phenomenal statistic from the Deep Space Network. Couldn't be happier with that. We started our solar array deployment about five minutes later, as planned. Uh, the arrays deployed properly. We spun down to 0.4 RPM as predicted, right on the dot, and then the spacecraft spun us back up to one RPM as planned. Uh, we were left off about 19 degrees off sun within the 20 degree cone that we needed, so we did not need to turn to, to uh, put the arrays on the sun. We were already pointed in the right direction. Um, so everything was our favorite word, nominal. 
We, um, we also, on my way over here, um, I got a call saying that we had sent in our first uh, command. We, we uh, sent a no-op uh, command that doesn't do anything, just proves that we do have commandability. So I'm happy to say that we are stable, we are spinning, we are power positive, the, the arrays are picking up power and, and recharging the battery, and we're commandable. And so those are the four things that we wanted today. Couldn't be happier. The, um, the other thing I was going to note was uh, our batteries only discharged to 90% during the ascent, so uh, they gave us a phenomenal uh, performance during that time. And in fact, they didn't have to work that long because uh, they were good for six or six plus hours uh, after separation, and we, uh, we got off on the solar rays within minutes. So thank you, thank you, thank you to the extended Juno team, our um, KSC and launch vehicle friends, the uh, science community that's, that we uh, were eager to do this for. It was just a, a team effort from start to finish. I'm really looking forward to a, a great ops ride. Thank you, Jan, and we'll take questions now. Please give the, your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you, and we'll start here in the front with Marcia. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, probably for Mr. Adams and maybe Dr. Mm -hmm. Bolton too, but um, today of all days, people are worried about money. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, a um, billion dollars I know is on, on cost, but can you just sort of say why you guys think that this is going to be well money well spent? Uh, I'll go first and then Scott can correct me. <laughs> no, no, actually, um, you know, under exploring the solar system is all about finding our place in the universe. And there is something about exploration that strokes the spirit of every person. And so I believe that unlocking the mysteries of how we got here is a fundamental question that if everybody would pause and think about for a moment, they would find uh, is something that's deep within them. And I believe that it's worth the money to go find out the answers to these questions. You want to add to any of that? I think you said it pretty well. I mean, um, I think, you know, searching for our uh, origin and understanding the fundamentals of nature is, uh, is something that uh, all societies uh, should be trying to do. And of course, uh, the more successful your society is, the more you can afford to, uh, to go after these really fundamental questions that are so important. And, and, and that's really how you progress uh, technologically. That's how you progress uh, philosophically. You have to learn about ourselves, and, and, uh, and these investments are really in ourselves, and I, and I believe they're worth it. The other thing about, you know, a billion dollars is a lot of money, um, but if you think about what we're doing with Juno, we're, we're, um, we've got incredibly sophisticated instruments, some of the most advanced that have ever, ever been on any spacecraft at all, and we're going into orbit around Jupiter uh, with these. Um, so traditionally, these things are even more expensive, and, and we've, we've uh, really designed something through the synergy of the, of the engineers and the managers and the scientists together to do, do it even more efficiently than it's ever been done before. So I think we're, we're showing that you can even get more done for the money. Okay, Stefano? Yes, thank you. Stefano Colodan for Italian uh, Radio and TV. Um, <coughs> excuse me, what is the current speed of the spacecraft? If you know. know or at separation. We'll probably have to get that. Oh, for yeah, you. we'll have to get back to you. I'm not sure if it's in the press kit or not, but you're asking at separation, what was our, what was our velocity? The only thing I can tell you is it's greater than the escape velocity of the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know that exact number, but I'll bet you uh, one of our guys can get that to you. Okay, question right here. Uh, Leo Enright with uh, Irish Television. I, I was wondering what an average day at the office is going to look like for the flight control team for the next five years. I mean, is there a room where people will gather every day to control this spacecraft, or do they just come to it once a week, or uh, can they do it, you know, from their sofa at home uh, with a, an internet connection? Or, you know, could you talk just briefly, uh, how does it look when you're in a coast for this length? Well, um, it's not five years of boredom, that's for sure. Uh, at, at first, what we'll do is uh, monitor the spacecraft around the clock because we want, it's a, it's a 
brand new baby, we want to make sure that we learn to uh, understand and appreciate its quirks and idiosyncrasies. So uh, we want to monitor it carefully. When we feel comfortable, and so we have DSN passes around the clock. When we feel comfortable that we can, um, we'll probably give up on the night shift first <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll back off a little bit. Uh, we do have a, a maneuver planned at 20 days, which may or may not be needed depending on how the launch vehicle performed, and we should know that uh, within a week we'll know whether we need to do that maneuver or not. But uh, we, we were left off in such a, a great place from the launch vehicle. Um, I'll place my bets when I get home. <laughs> Um, then we'll move into um, characterizing the instruments. So we'll get to know the engineering subsystems first, and then we'll do the low voltage checkouts of the instruments and the high voltage checkouts of the, ins of the three instruments that operate at high voltage. That'll take through about December. Then we have our two deep space maneuvers um, about a year after launch, September 2012 timeframe. We start our DSM preparation campaign, as we call it, in about the February time frame. We want to make sure that we um, dot the I's and cross the T's, take that design down to the nth level, have the right peer level reviews, independent reviews to make sure that we're not missing something. And so um, the team will uh, decrease in size because we'll have a larger staff at the start. To, we, we carry some of the development folks into operations to make sure that we benefit from their knowledge and, and we um, we don't miss anything as we make the transition into a more of a steady state operations. Um, so we'll work on that DSM preparation and then um, the months fly by pretty quickly when you're doing something like that and then a year later we have the Earth flyby, October 2013. So I, and we'll do the same sort of preparation campaign several months ahead of time using the Earth flyby um, appropriately as a, as a practice run for uh, what we're going to do on one of our passes at Jupiter. Then when we go out into the quiet cruise, I, I believe we will have some downtime. Shortly after launch, we'll get down to the two tracks a day, and then we'll get down to the two tracks a week and one track a week. Then it'll, it'll go up and down depending on the activities that we have on board and, and, and how often, you know, when we're doing the uh, instrument checkouts, for example, we'll have more passes. And the quiet cruise will be down to about once a week, but people, People do meet daily. We'll have daily status meetings for several months. Very t it's a very tactical operation at this point. Um, we like the team to come in to do the <laughs> to have those tech those technical meetings and make sure we have the tag up. But we have a distributed team. Uh, the spacecraft team uh, is flying it out of Denver, and so we have all the modern conveniences of internet, uh, video conferencing, teleconferencing that we use we've used during our development, and we'll continue to to, to do that. And then, of course, we have the whole science community. Uh, we want the scientists to come and, and reside with us at JPL during the checkouts, but then they'll be back at their institutions. We've already proven out that we can flow the data end to end all the way out to their institutions. They can, they can use the, their familiar equipment and um, be at their home institutions when they uh, get their data. So, so it'll really, the tempo will vary from the start of the mission as we progress. Bill? Bill Hartwick, CBS. Well, Janice sort of answered my question too, but but just maybe a little follow-on. Sometimes these flights, deep space missions, there's still software development required, and you're still working on the science plan during transit. Is this a mission where you pretty well know what you're going to do when you get there, or are you still refining how you're going to go about it? As far as the flight software that's residing in the onboard processor from the engineering perspective, um, we have no post-launch development planned. Uh, we have already designed and tested our JOI sequence. That's not to say that we won't do, um, we'll, we'll dust off those notebooks when we get close, we'll run that again, we'll make sure that anything that we've learned from the behavior of the spacecraft will modify the sequence as appropriate. Uh, but that, I would consider that more part of normal business. Um, I'll let Scott talk about the science planning because some of it's done to a certain level and others will continue to refine. Um, to a large uh, scale, we have the science plan figured out um, and we kind of know what we're going to do. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that this, this mission is so efficient is that we've designed it in a way to, uh, to just gather the data with, with little detailed planning, unlike some of the uh, other types of uh, missions that go. But we still haven't built the sequences for what would actually be run at Jupiter. So we, we will have to do that, and there will be some choices that can be made. And, um, and some of those choices will wait to see how the instruments are functioning and, and the idiosyncrasies that Jan mentioned earlier. 
when we go through all the calibrations and we go through how the uh, and learn how the instruments work and exactly um, how well the measurements are that we can predict, um, then we will refine our plan a little bit. But to a large scale, we have our plan already figured out. When we go into orbit, we know pretty much where we're going to get what measurement. And, and just one, one quick follow on. I think you guys addressed this at one of the pre launch, and I can't remember what the answer was. When you guys do the flyby, are you going to be taking any imagery or science? I mean, when's the, when's the first time we're going to see any? Fly pictures out of Earth, you Earth, mean? Yeah, yeah. The Earth when, flyby? When are we going to see pictures for the first time out of your instruments? That's what I'm looking for. Um, well, I can't tell you that that uh, when the first day that we'll get an image down of, of anything, because we may we may accelerate that plan from what we have right now, depending on how things work. But um, right now, we plan to operate uh, most of the instruments at the Earth. One to learn how they operate and make sure that we understand how a sequence that we would actually operate near Jupiter will work, sort of an example. In previous missions that have gone to the outer planets um, that have had Earth flybys, you know, it's really dictated by the energy and, and the fact that you need to go around in order to get out to the outer planet. You made incredible use of the fact that you went by the Earth, not only to calibrate your instruments, but to also get new science, but maybe most importantly, you learn about the spacecraft long before you get to the outer planet when you're going there so that you can adapt your plan if needed. So we will make use of all of those things. We will be limited by the fact that some instruments uh, we will have to analyze and make sure that thermally, this close to the sun, since they're designed to operate at the Jupiter, that we aren't taking any risks. That will be our first priority. And then the calibrations that are unique at Earth will also be the second priority. And then the third will be whatever new science we can possibly get. Okay, a question right here in the back. Mark Ratterman from Talking Space. Uh, question for Scott Bolton. Do you think that our educators that are uh, teaching our middle school, high school children, do you think that they'll be, uh, be having some exciting things to talk about after Juno enters orbit, or will they have some things to talk to their kids about beforehand? Um, well, I, I hope they have exciting things to talk about beforehand, um, even right now, because there are exciting things. I, I assume you mean just respect to Juno, though, um, not all science. But um, there will be some things that they can talk about. Uh, a lot of them are technological uh, stuff, advances that we've made with solar arrays, the radiation vault, things that are unique to Juno, the challenges that have gone on, I think, help teach uh, kids that might uh, be interested in engineering. And the science that's coming is lessons that we've already started to incorporate in curriculum uh, for that, those grade levels. And in fact, we're trying to push it down to elementary school. Now, of course, once we get to Jupiter and we learn the new things that Juno uh, is going to learn for us, um, that will open up you know, a, a wealth of new information that will provide it. And so you know, that may dwarf what we've been able to do prior to that, at least with respect to Juno. Okay, let's come up here to the front to uh, Ken Kramer. Uh, hi, Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine. For uh, Scott Bolton, please. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about uh, how, how this idea originated in, in your mind, the kernel of the idea. When you came up with it, how it might have evolved. Is it, is it every the bit that you wanted? This, this, you know, the idea for the mission, did it evolve over time with the instruments or what? Um, it did. Uh, some some uh, instrument ideas might have been uh, like a revelation. Um, other ones have evolved over time. Um, it started long before I, uh, I was a kid uh, when, when the first uh, scientists were trying to go into polar orbit around Jupiter. In fact, um, even in the 70s, people were arguing as we started to plan Galileo that maybe they should maybe the, that that kind of a mission should be a polar orbiter. Um, most of those studies were aimed at trying to understand the polar magnetosphere, although some of them understood that if you could go into polar orbit, you might be able to get measure, better measurements of the magnetic and gravity field. And then uh, in the um, late 80s and 90s, um, there were missions that were conceived of uh, to go into. Uh, close orbits, polar, near polar, not truly polar, but highly inclined orbits similar to Juno's to look at the magnetic field and the uh, gravity field. Um, and those, uh, one of those was called Inside Jupiter, and it progressed and tried to, uh, tried to win. It was also proposed competitively and, um, and didn't make it all the way to the final round. 
And then about the time um, Cassini was flying by Jupiter, um, I was on the Cassini team on a few instruments as a, as a co-investigator and uh, was arguing that we should do science at Jupiter as we flew by. Um, and uh, I was uh, able to persuade uh, enough people that that, uh, that opened the door, but I was also tasked with figuring out which science we should do. So a colleague of mine and myself ran workshops to try to figure out the science that we could do by uh, going by Cassini. And um, one of those experiments uh, that I came up with was to borrow um, the radar antenna it, was the high, it also uses the high-gain antenna on Cassini and map Jupiter's radiation belts because it could work in a listen-only mode. It was an instrument that was primarily designed to see through the clouds of Titan and map out uh, Titan's surface, which was incredibly high priority also for Cassini. And I knew I was very familiar with that because I was also uh, working to figure out what we should do at Titan, so I knew how that instrument worked pretty well. And. Um, so we borrowed this thing, and, and, uh, and, I, and I suggested that we make a map of these high-energy radiation belts, which was part of the science that I had done uh, before. And um, that got approved, and one of my other co-investigators came up and said, you know, can you use that to figure out the water abundance inside Jupiter? And I said, no, I don't think so, and we worked out some details. And then the next day I was, uh, you know, getting ready to work and literally in the shower. Uh, <laughs> And I realized, gosh, if I, yeah, I was looking for water, and there I was. Um, and I realized, gosh, if we got a bunch of these antennas in the right place over the poles, I could get away from the noise of the radiation belts and see into the planet and, uh, and maybe make that measurement that uh, my colleague had asked for. And so I came back in the next day kind of excited, saying, I think I figured out a way to do this, um, but not with Cassini and we don't have anything that can do it, but I think if you made something like this, it might work. And um, that colleague of mine was named Toby Owen, and he went and got a colleague of his named Daniel Gautier, and they came in and tried to argue with me on why that was so important to do and how fundamental that measurement would be, and they were saying it was the, could be the basis of a mission. And I had my doubts, although I knew, because every scientist thinks their science is really important. Um, <laughs> turns out theirs is. Um, and I realized uh, later that they were largely responsible for the Cassini mission uh, getting conceived. So I realized that they really knew a lot about why we should do things, and so I started looking more carefully. And then, and that's basically how that uh, experiment then had to be go through a long, painstaking process of convincing my colleagues that knew uh, about the hardware and the measurements that it could actually be done. A lot of people didn't think that we could figure out how to do this, but I ke we kept pushing and kept working. And once we got that figured out, um, we then joined uh, with the other teams uh, that were already interested in doing Jupiter's gravity and magnetic fields, and then another team that was interested in doing the polar magnetosphere, and I put them all together under one umbrella, and NASA came out with an opportunity that uh, could allow that kind of a mission uh, you know, at that level of uh, expense and, and complexity. And so we all came in under one umbrella and proposed Juno. And that was back, I mean, the ideas were conceived maybe back in around 2000, 1999, when the water abundance idea came in. And it got added for uh, um, the AO was in about 2003. And so that's when the teams all came together. And so that's how long we've been working together. So if I could just follow up. Jim Green, when you heard this, or your predecessor, what did you think? <laughs> well, uh, well, first off, uh, Juno was selected when we came on board. This is Jim Green and myself, um, and uh, we were we were given this mission, and we were immediately impressed with how well it was run, and um, the fact that it had been it had spent some time uh, in Phase B, and so it was ready. To graduate and so one of the first things that we did was we ran it through a confirmation review where we said okay no kidding for sure for real is this science that we really want to do can we do it at the cost and on schedule that uh, that's been proposed uh, derived during the phase B and all of the answers came back unanimously yes and so we said uh, this is compelling science let's move forward and uh, we're very excited about it it's going to tell us a lot about 
not just Jupiter, um, but I'm sure Scott's mentioned in some of the science briefings of just about the solar system in general and how it was formed and maybe even a little bit about how the Earth was formed. So we're very excited. Any other questions? All right, we have, uh, well, let's get Craig because he's right here. Uh, thanks very much. It's Craig Kovalt with Aerospace America. For Jim Adams, uh, a question rate relative to the decadal. Uh, now that you've had some time, uh, how do things stand with ESA on major issues on the decadal? Anything new there relative Mars, for example? So the, the decadal survey is, uh, for those that don't know, is a 10-year outlook of the science that ought to be uh, pursued by planetary science from 2013 to 2023, essentially, or the end of 2022. Um, we're in the process of mapping out our plan on how to respond to the decadal survey. And uh, international partnerships, like in all of our missions, pay, play a key role in that. Uh, it's not quite all firmed up yet, but we're working on that. What we're really excited about is the fact that uh, Juno played a key role in the previous decadal survey and tells us a lot, uh, or answers a lot of the questions that were asked by the previous decadal survey. And so we're looking forward to doing that in the middle of this decade as we're working on re responding and putting together missions that will re respond to the next decadal survey. Okay, we'll take uh, one more question. Uh, this lady right in front right here. Jackie Goddard for the Times of London. Um, this phrase, unlocking the mysteries of the universe, is one that folks like you use a lot in explaining stuff to us and that we use a lot when we're writing our articles and whatever. Um, in terms of this particular mission, how great a leap in understanding are we expecting? Is it going to be kind of inching our way along that scale of understanding or are we expecting one giant leap? Um. Well, my, my belief is that we make progress by taking many small steps. And, um, and there are some great leaps that you get to do once in a rare while. But most of the progress we make uh, as uh, humans is, is we make small steps and we just have to keep at it. Um, you know, whether this is a giant leap or a small step maybe is, is somewhat judgment here. But I, th I think that the real uh, interest in Juno and, and Jupiter is that it's really giving us insight into the very earliest times of our, of our solar system formation, right after the sun formed to the beginning of the planet, the first planet. And, uh, and in that sense, it's a big leap because that's a big step to take, to get that first step that goes from a sun or a star to the planets because, you know, the, the, the planets are made of a little bit differently than the sun or we wouldn't be here today. Uh, there is a difference there. We don't really understand how that happened or what happened and what the elements or volatiles were doing early in the solar system. And so that's a big step, a big leap. Um, however, uh, you know, I don't want to um, imply that, that other steps aren't equally important. I mean, I think that if we're going to understand nature and understand ourselves and our role and all of the planets, we need to keep looking at all the planets. We need to look at every body we can in the solar system and in the universe and galaxies, stars, everything, and really try to understand how they're different and what role they play and how we fit in. Todd? Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida Today. I was just curious if uh, any of you were conscious of the fact that you guys are the first uh, post-shuttle era launch and uh, what your thoughts, if any, have been on that and whether you uh, really could kind of kind of feel that. Uh, um, I, I certainly felt it today as that rocket was going up. Uh, and I think a lot of people around the center did. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. That's a great question. And maybe all three of us could answer what we think about that. Um, about four months ago, I was in an elevator with Charlie <laughs> Bolden, and I said, you know, Juno is the first launch after the last shuttle, and we need to find a way to engage the people that are going to feel that loss. And so I said, you know, normally we invite 300 to 1,000 people out to uh, an expendable launch vehicle 
launch, I said, Charlie, what do you think about inviting 10,000 people? And he said, that's a great idea. Let's figure out how to make that happen. And um, you know, I immediately backed away and I said, oh, well, I don't know if I could do 10,000, maybe 5,000. He said, if you don't try, <laughs> if you don't try, then you won't make it. And uh, latest estimates were that we beat the 10,000, not just invitees, but actual people that watched. And we're extremely excited about coupling the, uh, the, the energy that the <coughs> nation has with regard to human spaceflight into understanding what we're doing in science. Because right now, science is really the positive face of this agency. We're looking very forward to what we can tell the world about what we're doing in planetary science. Um, and, you know, stick around. It's going to be a great year. We've got GRAIL and MSL coming up, and it's just going to be fantastic. You guys have comments on that? Um, well, I mean, it was exciting. It's, it's sort of a privilege, I feel, um, to be in that, that transition spot and have the attention and the spotlight that comes with that. Um, you know, we didn't plan this. When we were figuring out when to launch, we were just trying to figure out, you know, when are we going to finish and where's Jupiter and where's Earth and how do we get there? And uh, we picked our launch date. And, uh, or I should say it, the launch date picked us. And, um, and then the shuttle program started to wind down and of course, uh, you know, it, uh, the exact last shuttle danced around a little bit and we ended up falling on that uh, uh, right where it is. I have a great respect for the human spaceflight program and the, and the shuttle program. I think they achieved incredible things. And so I'm honored to, you know, be in this transition uh, trying to help out a little bit. I think you're right. There's people that, that feel a loss and, and there's also um, the public that needs to understand that um, the NASA is more than about the shuttle. Um, it's really about exploration in general and just reaching out, trying to understand and, and reach ourselves both physically as humans out to the stars. You know, when I was a kid, I used to look up, you know, from these dark fields and feel myself hurtling through space on this planet, you know, kind of on a rock. I'm hurtling through this three-dimensional star field. I used to imagine this. Of course, I watched Star Trek, too. And... Um, and I think that, you know, reaching out there, trying to get out there is very important. So, I, you know, I, I really uh, love the, sh the shuttle program and the Apollo program that came before that. But we're in this magical period, and we need to make sure that everybody realizes that NASA also reaches out to understand nature with science. And this is a platform to uh, emphasize that to people. And so I think that uh, we're fortunate that um, to be here. And Juno, fortunately, is, is sort of an exciting, fundamental mission that can carry that kind of thing forward. Jan, you probably may have your own views. <laughs> uh, I, I would just like, I mean, I agree with what Jim and Scott said, and I guess I would just like to add that it's, uh, it's serendipitous that we are the first mission to launch um, in the post-shuttle era, and I'd like to think that the, um, the excitement that the human spaceflight program has generated in the American and, and world population <laughs> will carry over to the planetary scientific missions a little more than it used to. As Jim pointed out, you know, it's unusual to get 10,000 people at a planetary launch, uh, an unmanned launch. And so I'm just happy for the opportunity to uh, publicize the, the great science that we're doing. And Maybe we're getting some of that because we're riding on the coattails of the excitement and, and emotion of the last shuttle launch. All right, that's going to conclude our launch coverage today. And we're going to close out now with a replay of the launch from earlier this afternoon. Thank you very much. T minus 10, 9. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition and liftoff of the Atlas V with Juno on a trek to Jupiter, a planetary piece of the puzzle on the beginning of our solar system. Picture our roll program is in progress. Vehicle body rates look good. Mr. P has gone to fixed angle shuttle. Big chamber pressures have plateaued. I'm rolling off. Signatures look good. RD-180 operation looks excellent at this point in the flight.
Mach 1. SRB chambers continue to roll off. Max Q, 